Hello, this is a closer look at Korsakoff syndrome part two, where I'm going to discuss the topic of diagnosis. Now, the ideal situation is that um, someone is taken very quickly to an emergency room or a hospital um, when they notice that something's wrong with the, the person or the person realizes something's wrong with themselves. Um, but often this doesn't happen. Often, frankly, the person is sick for a long period of time in isolation before someone discovers them by accident. Um, or they collapse and they have a severe case of the Wernicke's encephalopathy or the brain swelling and they're taken to the emergency room. Um, but ideally, we would like to see this diagnosed quickly in an emergency room or um, an addiction treatment hospital um, so they can start to do some early intervention. Uh, it has a very sudden onset, which is also a part of the issue because the individual is often not aware that anything's wrong with them. They're literally fine one day and the next they're not. Um, and what also can complicate this is that if it's due to alcohol use, the person first needs to completely abstain from alcohol and any other substances so we can rule out any effects of um, alcohol intoxication and withdrawal. Many of the symptoms we see with uh, Korsakoff syndrome particularly things like the um, memory issues or the mood swings or the, the um, walking impairment, the gait, the uneven gait, are also symptoms of being intoxicated or the early stages of withdrawal. So we really need to achieve uh, several months of abstinence in some cases to make sure that we're actually dealing with Korsakoff syndrome and permanent brain damage versus um, post-acute withdrawal, which does improve over time. Another thing that makes this difficult is that many people, particularly those living with addiction, aren't seeing their doctor on a regular basis. So without that regular medical care, there's no one to teach them um, that this even exists, because this is completely preventable, um, or intervene uh, in any earlier stage of the illness. So they miss this opportunity to get some prevention or get some early care or early diagnosis. It's important to note um, to emphasize really how much this goes underdiagnosed and if it's diagnosed, how much it goes underreported. Uh, many individuals diagnosed with KS uh, are homeless or, or they have completely um, alienated any friends or family. They've completely withdrawn into isolation, so they don't have that social or family support. So uh, they're not caught when they first get sick. No one's there to notice that there's a problem. So it often doesn't get diagnosed correctly because some will go completely without medical care um, or their family and friends aren't aware what's going on or the extent of their drinking or their malnourishment so they don't know what to think, uh, they don't know what's wrong with them or they get misdiagnosed with a different type of dementia um, or if they are correctly diagnosed it can go underreported because family members um, are really up against a tremendous stigma when it comes to any mental health disorder, but addiction in particular. So they might, um, I've, I've seen cases where family members um, just out of embarrassment or trying to protect their family will say their loved one actually fell when they didn't and that they attributed to a head injury or after they're diagnosed if they're trying to um, start you know, maybe getting benefits or they're with a new provider, they might say that their individual had a stroke or something else um, and not be upfront with the Korsakoff syndrome. And I really think in many cases it's because they don't know how to explain it and so many really aren't aware of what it is and, and how to help people with it. So what would a, a good diagnostic process look like? Um, in an emergency room, we're going to start um, with the medical assessment first to make sure the individual is stable. If the brain swelling um, is too severe, the person uh, could end up comatose. So they're going to first make sure that they're stable. If the person is stable and talking, they're going to do what's called a mental status exam. And an MSC is a quick um, assessment that's done basically through conversation to uh, give us a better idea of cognitive and emotional functioning. So they might, um, the, well, first we're going to see if they're oriented. We're going to ask them if they know their name, if they know the other people in the room. Do they know where they are? Do they know what day it is, what season it is, who the president is, things like that, um, which may seem like really basic questions, but we're trying to get a sense of how well they're oriented uh, to the present. 
we're going to look at different cognitive things. So they might give them simple math tasks to do or um, ask them to um, remember a few words. So I'm going to ask you to remember ball, cup, puppy. And they'll continue the interview. And a few minutes later, um, ask them, now, do you remember those words I, I told you to remember a few minutes ago? There were three words. Can you tell me what those words were? To get an idea of what their short-term memory is like. Ideally, if someone, um, if there's a family member or a friend, we can ask, you know, what are the names of your siblings? Where did you grow up? What's your mother's maiden name? And check with those individuals to see if that information is correct um, to get an idea of their, how well they're accessing long-term memory. And it's also helpful to get a better social history, especially if alcohol is involved, to have people who are close to them um, who may be able to give us better information. Again, if someone's coming into an emergency room or you know, treatment setting and they have memory issues, they're not going to be the best historian, so that can be a challenge. Um, the physician is going to order, you know, likely order blood tests, and we're going to look at those thiamine levels. We're going to see where their nutrients are, um, because thiamine is only one of many things that the brain needs to function, uh, but thiamine in particular is the cause of Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, typically, not in the ER, but if you have um, if the person's under the care of a neurologist, you can advocate for an MRI or CT scan uh, to confirm the extent of the brain damage. Uh, I've had three family members um, suffer from Korsakoff syndrome um, over the last few decades. I had my great uncle, his sister, who was my grandmother, and her son, who is my uncle. Uh, my uncle um, is still living with it. He was diagnosed about six years ago, and we were able to get MRIs about a year and a half apart, and we were able to see the extent of the atrophy of his brain and where the location of his lesions are uh, to see how quickly he's progressing in his illness. And for us, we found it very helpful, um, but it wasn't easy. We really did have to advocate for it um, to, to get those images so we had a better idea of what we were up against. Other medical considerations that they're going to be looking at, uh, abnormal eye movement, um, again with brain swelling, you can have uh, eye muscle paralysis where the eyes can't track a moving object very well. They look like they're twitching or moving um, very slowly. Decreased or abnormal reflexes are always a sign of neurological impairment. A high pulse, low blood pressure, things that um, are also associated with alcohol withdrawal or um, alcohol poisoning. Uh, looking for low body temperature. Muscle weakness or atrophy, and atrophy is where the muscles are actually um, are shrinking because they're not being used enough. That's going to give us an indication of how active the person is and um, how well they've been taking care of themselves. Uneven gait or poor coordination. Um, this is what some refer to as the Korsakoff shuffle, where uh, they're a little uneven or they're unsteady, so they take small steps. This could be because um, they're unsure of their balance, so they're not going to take that risk of taking a normal gait or um, their walking is so uneven because of poor coordination that they really can't manage larger steps. Um, we may also see uh, tremors. It's also a sign of alcohol withdrawal. Um, and then acute skin changes in a red, beefy-looking tongue, a thick tongue, is also an indication. So the root cause of all of this is vitamin B1, or thiamine. And when the deficiency gets so severe, the levels get too low, this causes swelling and uh, brain cell death, essentially, because our neurons need thiamine to function. So this leads to clusters of lesions in the brain, and these can't be repaired. Uh, we can't regenerate these brain cells once they're gone. Um, even with you know, given injections of thiamine in, in treatment, it can help slow down the death of other cells that might be in process. But once these are gone, unfortunately, that's it. Um, now, thiamine deficiency in Korsakoff syndrome is not only caused by alcohol abuse. Uh, that was one of the earliest connections made with it. Um, but now we know that other things, other diseases, um, eating disorders, AIDS, Crohn's disease, uh, which is um, a gastrointestinal disease, bariatric surgery, chemotherapy, uh, mercury poisoning, and any other issue that's going to cause problems with nutrition absorption can lead to a drastic thiamine deficiency and can cause Korsakoff syndrome. Now, in recent decades, um, they have discovered a genetic marker 
um, that can basically tell us if someone's genetically predisposed to Corsicobs or not. Um, you know, as we know, if we have a group of people who all suffer from chronic alcoholism and have all been lifelong drinkers, they're in varying shapes of physical condition. Um, some people with alcoholism have very high physical tolerance and will be drinking for decades before they have any issues. Some, um, you know, are really sensitive to it and get very sick very quickly. And now we know there is a genetic predisposition to the thiamine sensitivity. Now, a little side note, one question I often get uh, from families is, you know, how often does this happen? How often do I, as a, as a clinician, see this? Because this can make you feel very alone trying to deal with this because it's not really that known, that well known. Um, so the prevalence rate, and the prevalence is how frequently something occurs, and we look at studies, so this is a, a statistical band. The prevalence rate is estimated at 0 to 3 percent of the population, and we know that 0 isn't really reality, but it's a very small section of the population um, will be diagnosed. Mostly uh, middle-aged men, so between 45 and 65. Women can also get it. That's um, a common myth is that women uh, don't get this at all. But women tend to be diagnosed at a younger age. Um, from my own personal experience, uh, my grandmother was diagnosed with this in her mid-40s, but the two men in my family uh, weren't diagnosed until late 50s, early 60s. Um, and the, the rate really comes from autopsy studies because we tend to miss this while someone's alive. Again, for a number of reasons, um, mostly because uh, people that are diagnosed with Korsakovs as a result of alcohol tend to be so isolated and not taking care of themselves. They tend to be sick and no one really catches it and they just live the rest of their lives that way uh, or die younger than they would have had they been diagnosed. Um, so this number is really coming from autopsy studies where they're looking at the actual brains and the degree of atrophy of the brains of people who have, have passed away. So we're only getting it right about, we're only catching about 20% of the cases. Other studies looking at um, dementia in older adults in treatment facilities, and it's important to note that dementia, they're not referring specifically to Korsakoff syndrome. Um, they're looking at kind of dementia, a wide range of criteria for this. And this, those studies have shown anywhere from 9% to about 23% of older adults in treatment facilities uh, for alcohol withdrawal um, have some kind of dementia. And we've established that alcohol really does a number on the body in a multitude of ways, um, but it does affect the brain um, significantly over time. So why is this important? It's important because as our population generally is, is aging and people are able to live longer with addiction as we have better treatment options and better health care for mental health, uh, these rates are probably going to increase. So we're going to see alcohol-related dementia becoming a little more prevalent, and this can be positive for uh, those families trying to deal with someone with Korsakoff syndrome because maybe we'll get a little more awareness and uh, more resources our way. So that was just a quick discussion of uh, diagnostic issues related to Korsakoff syndrome. Again, if you have any questions or comments or other topics you'd like me to discuss, please feel free to comment or uh, get in touch with me. Thanks.